Good morning and welcome back to day three of session one of this round of the Department of Education's negotiated rulemaking. Uh, my name is Brady Roberts, uh, part of the FMCS facilitation team. We are going to jump right back into discussion after roll call, uh, so let's dive right into that. Um, if folks just want to turn on their camera to let folks uh, who are viewing on the live stream um, see your face and we can jump right back into discussion. So first off, uh, representing accrediting agencies, we have our primary, Ms. Jamie Ann Studley. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to see the sunrise, something I rarely do. Good morning, Jamie. And she's joined by her alternate, uh, Dr. Laura Racer-King. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, representing consumer advocacy organizations, we have our primary, Ms. Carolyn Bast. Good morning. And her alternate, Mr. Jalen Herbin. I'm still waiting for Jalen to join. Uh, representing civil rights organizations, we have Ms. Amanda Martinez. Present here. Thank you. Good morning. Morning, Amanda. Uh, representing financial aid administrators at post secondary institutions, we have Samantha Veter. Good morning, everyone. Morning, Sam. And she's joined by her alternate, uh, Excuse me, I lost my place. Uh, Mr. David Peterson. Morning, David. Morning. Uh, representing four year public institutions. I was I'm muted, sorry. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Marvin Smith, uh, our, our primary for four year public institutions. Good morning. Morning. And uh, Deborah Stanley is alternate. Good morning. Representing legal aid, uh, legal assistance organization, uh, organizations that represent students and or borrowers, we have Johnson Tyler. All right, good morning. And his alternate, uh, Jessica Renucci. Hi. Good morning. Um, representing minority serving institutions, we have our primary, Dr. Beverly Hogan, who is not able to join us this morning, but we are joined by her alternate, uh, Ms. Ashley Schofield. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Representing private nonprofit institutions of higher education, we have Kelly Perry. Morning. And her primary, Mr. Emmanuel Guillory. Still waiting for Emmanuel to join us. Uh, representing proprietary institutions of higher education, we have Bradley Adams. Good morning. Morning, Brad. Uh, and his alternate, Michael Lenowitz. Good morning. Good morning. Representing State Attorneys General, we have Adam Well. Present. Good morning. Good morning, Adam. And his alternate, Yael Shabbat. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Representing State Higher Education Executive Officers, Authorizing Agencies, and or State Regulators of Higher Education and or Loan Servicers, we have Debbie Cochran. Good morning. Good morning, Debbie. And her alternate, Mr. David Sokolow. Good morning. Good morning. Representing students and student loan borrowers, we have Ernest uh, Izuego. Good morning. And his alternate, Carney King. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, representing two year public institutions of higher education, we have Dr. Ann Kress. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. And her alternate, William Durden. Good morning. Nice to be here. Uh, rounding out our name negotiators, we have representing U.S. military service members, veterans, or groups representing them, uh, Travis Hoare. Here, good morning. And his alternate, Armac Nasarian. Good morning. Good morning. Um, negotiating on behalf of the Department of Education, we have Mr. Greg Martin. Good morning. Good morning, and he is joined by a number of folks uh, with the Office of General Counsel, I believe. We are joined today by Mr. Steve Finley. Yep, good morning. Morning, Steve. We are also joined by two expert advisors. We have for compliance auditor, uh, Mr. David McClintock. Good morning, happy to be here again. Morning, Dave. And our labor economist, Dr. Adam Looney. We're still waiting for Professor Looney to join us, but we will announce him when he does. All right, um, now Greg, I believe we are still on 6668 uh, 171 subparagraph B. Um, just as a quick reminder, we do ask that folks try to hold their comments to three minutes per comment uh, and try to uh, not repeat what has already been said. 
I have from our order from yesterday, um, Kelly and Barmack had raised their hands. So, so if you'd still like to make your points, Kelly and Barmack, the floor is yours with Kelly being first. Um, and I just, as a reminder, we have Yael in on behalf of state AGs and Ashley uh, here on behalf of minority serving institutions. And, and Brady, I, and maybe I missed this, I just wanted to make note that Jalen uh, has joined. Oh, great, Committee. morning Jalen. Okay. Uh, Brad, I see your hand. I think you're muted right now, Brad. Uh, yes, sir. I was just uh, falling in line behind Kelly and Barmax, so uh, they can go first. Uh, oh, gotcha. Okay. And just as another note, we do have uh, Jessica in on behalf of legal aid organizations. Um, but K Kelly, do you want to um, pick us up with where we left off yesterday? Sure. Um, I, I think it, are we we're talking about B right now. I think if we're on B, I will pass until we get to uh, C. Okay, understood. Um, Armac, did you want to speak to B? I did. Okay, go ahead. Um, I am struggling, and this may just be my my lack of understanding. I'm struggling with Romanet two, the withdrawal of owner's equity, uh, and the exception under Cap A uh, that reads or is the equivalent of wages in a sole proprietorship or partnership or a required dividend return of capital and I have two issues with that one of which is I don't know I mean almost anything could be declared to be equivalent to wages uh, so I don't know that creating an exception that large is uh, is advisable but more importantly I don't understand what a required dividend is who would require the the, the, the payment of dividends except the controlling uh, board of directors or the controlling individuals. Uh, I, uh, I, I, you know, uh, don't feel comfortable answering that right at this moment. I, I want to make certain that I get you a, a good uh, response on that. Um, we'll take that. Uh, we'll take that back to our, our team. Steve, do you want to address that or should we? Uh... Yeah, I think we'll, should get, we'll get some internal clarification first. Thank you. And Dave, I see uh, your hand as well. Is Brad, is it okay if I just jump to him as our advisor? Great. Okay. Yeah, Dave, go ahead. I would just provide my thoughts. Oftentimes, uh, there could be required dividends for pass through entities. So uh, the entity itself does not pay, uh, pay taxes, it passes through to the owners. And there's operating agreements that require the dividends to be paid out to cover those taxes. And that's how it's often been addressed in these regulations. I believe, but I'm sure Greg and Steve will have further information. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brad, go ahead. Yes, good morning. Can I go back to the previous page? It would be one um, Romanet 1A regarding um, debts and liabilities incurred from settlements. I may have m missed us going through that yesterday be on page 13 of the red line, very bottom. You good. Um, so con conceptually, I do not have a problem with providing the department with material settlements, but my read of this is there's no definition of materiality. So I just want to confirm with the department, the department expects every immaterial law lawsuit or settlement or anyone that has a settlement debt to be reported to the department with no materiality threshold. So every trip and fall, every mile settlement with an employee, any severance agreement, and then that the department is going to take those dollars and recalculate the composite score every single time at every single institution in all sectors. Just feel as though that seems like a very large administrative burden, and especially to the larger private and non uh, private nonprofit and public institutions that have these settlements all the time. I just want to confirm that the department's expectation that if we had a hundred dollar settlement, we have to report that within 10 days of uh, incurring that that payment. Is that is that how I read this? Right now there is no no minimum associated uh, with it.
do you, uh, do, are you suggesting that there be a uh, I, I do. I think that's threshold. administrative burden. Yeah, yes, yes, sir. I think that's administrative burden both on the school and on the department um, to report every single settlement, regardless of materiality. I would, I would make that as a recommendation. Any comments on that? And I do see, um, Dave. I see your hand is up, but your video is off, so you're not in the queue right now. But if Feel free to, to to turn your camera on, and if you want to weigh in on that. Oh, Kelly was raising her hand on the video. No, sorry, I turned it on. I just didn't lower my hand. Sorry, Brady. Oh, okay, apologies. So, so Kelly, did you, was your point to to Brad's? Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, and, and maybe I'm not reading this the right way, but I am reading this as you only need to report if one of these things is affecting your composite score so if you have a you know if there's a a doubt or liability that results as as a, as a result of these things and and your composite score is below at this point it says one then that's when you have to report not that you're reporting every debt and liability is that correct I, i'm reading it as you have to recalculate to see if the composite score would be less than one not that you only have to do it if you are less than one. Let me get a, clarif a clarification on that. Okay. I just want to note that um, Professor Adam Looney has joined us, one of our advisors. So with that, Barmack, please. And I was going to comment on, on my previous point, which I will do, but l let me also comment on, on uh, Brad's observation. You know, the definition of materiality, whatever it may be uh, for accountants under FASB, is in fact what the department articulates here. Things become material insofar as participation in Title IV is concerned, based on whether an institution can satisfy the composite score uh, threshold uh, under the department's regulations. And I, and I, and I believe it was Carolyn, who observed that that 1.5, by the way, is the right threshold, something that I do agree with. So I, I you know, if it needs uh, some wordsmithing, great. But the concept is to say that if that if any of these events result in crossing the minimum threshold, that becomes actionable. So that's my comment on Brad's point with regard to the observation on pass throughs and required payments that is the way organizations get looted the department doesn't have any control over entities beyond the llc participating in the program uh, you can only regulate that that llc's conduct uh, you know if there's taxes due you know reach into your own pockets and pay it if the or if the um, participating school is going to be out of compliance. I would strongly recommend that that language under cap A at the end be struck. OK. We'll note that recommendation. All right, Carolyn, I see your hand next. Thank you. Um, I, I echo um, Barmack's concern about that language and um, would like a little bit of clarification as to its meaning as well. But but I, I would like to sort of return to the point that I was um, making yesterday, as I think it is uh, relevant to this provision as well, that um, this provision would only apply to a pr proprietary in, uh, institution with a score below 1.5 and um, would um, look um, only at whether the um, event created a recalculation where the where the school's composite score dropped below one. Um, I think that it would be important to extend this provision um, to to all proprietary schools, not just those who start off with a zone score, because um, this seems to create a situation where a school could be doing perfectly fine, but then have an, an uh, an incident that would result in a failing score but would not be captured by this trigger, which seems like a really big hole in this in this protection. Um, so I would argue that that should not 
be limited to scores uh, below 1.5 for proprietary schools. I also think in returning to my comment from yesterday that it's a problem that there's no consequence for any school that where the triggering event uh, puts them from good standing into the zone rather than to uh, below one. So I understand that this is aimed at uh, requiring a, a letter of credit, but in ordinarily there would be other protections that would come into place for schools in the zone, such as um, placement in a provisional certification. And it seems to me that these triggers should mirror the tradition, you know, the, the that structure, so that if there was a problem that caused, tr if a trigger caused a significant change, so that a school went from being in passing status to zone status, that there should be consequences or rather protections um, in place for those schools. So I think that there needs to be a little bit of a modification to, to these provisions that, that relate to calculation of scores. Thank you. I'll Thank just you. add to since I'm next to Q. Anyways, uh, I believe, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Greg, this pronouncement is not just for proprietary schools. So, uh, Carolyn, are you asking for a change to the language to only apply it to proprietary schools? This impacts everybody. I, um, I was looking at the language of, and perhaps I may have been looking at a different provision than you were looking at, but I was looking at the provision that has that is um, uh, Romanet 2 uh, A. Got, got it. I'm sorry. I'm in the section before. Uh, yeah, no, it's confusing because we we're talking about two sections. Sorry. On on section on so on Romanet one C above you know, for owners equity, I would like to just make a clarification here on uh, the bar defense. So my understanding. Uh, number one is I, I like that we have a measurable uh, concrete tool here to use at the 5% threshold. So thank you for giving us something to know what the number is. But my understanding on borrowed defense is it's a two-step process. Step one is that the staffer decide whether or not to discharge the loan. And that does not mean the school is liable at that point. The second step is a hearing official at the department that here's the case to determine whether or not the school is liable. So the trigger in C here would be based on the determination of the liability being incurred and not the initial step one when the staffer decides whether or not to discharge the loan. It's my understanding that it's when the when the when the, uh, as it says here, when, once the once the claim has been adjudicated in favor of the borrower, such that the school would would um, would 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 now owe it. But I, I I will clarify I will clarify that. Uh, Steve, I see your hand. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll clarify that. Uh, this issue is about determining at a, the stage at which it's appropriate to get additional financial protections from the school because of a of an identified increased risk. And so you're right, this is at the stage where the loans are discharged, but prior to the establishment of that liability against the institution. It's a, it's a tentative liability at that point that could be, that the department could seek to establish against the institution. My request would be a way to apply that, because we're talking about financial responsibility into the li liabilities incurred. It was very similar to the comment I made yesterday on B, just because a lawsuit has been initiated does not mean there's going to be a liability that is actually incurred to the school to impact the financial responsibility. Um, so again, this is for all schools too. This is not any one sector. So I just want to make sure that just because a student has uh, a loan discharge does not require that the school is financially liable to impact their financial responsibility. Would be my request to make that change. I mean, I'll, we'll take back the request. I would I would point out that um, that um, it's equal to or greater than five percent of the total total four HEA program funds. So I mean, I think you know, going back to what Steve said, we're looking at situations here that um, you know put uh, put the department at risk for loss. Um, 
So and 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 this is always about you know identifying uh, at what point at what point that occurs and 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 um, taking some action in in time to actually um, you know forestall that or or make or or uh, to get the to get the financial protection necessary if that looks like that's going to occur and that's and we wouldn't be talking about one you know one borrower defense claim here um, uh, you know five percent I think is a significant that's a significant volume but we'll definitely take back the comment okay um jamie i see your hand but i just briefly want to welcome emmanuel to uh our, our day today morning emmanuel but jamie please go ahead um uh, i think i'm taking us back briefly to um capital a um the debts liabilities issue i think there may be a drafting improvement because it's hard to read um uh, I know this is regulatory language, but whether um, it's, I, I believe it sums up that um, you have to know whether it will change your score to know whether you need to report those items. And some of us may not know whether the school can calculate its composite score itself or whether the secretary secretary's determination might be different from what the school's is. Would I know if I had a 1.5 or 6 score that could I recalculate my liabilities to know that it would fall below and therefore that I needed to tell you? Or do I need to tell you so that the department can recalculate it and know if it's fallen below 1.5? I just think um, it, it's not something we can rewrite as a group, but are you asking people to? to make that judgment and know if they need to tell you or to tell you about them so the department can determine if that change was made. And right, that, that, that could relate to whether you're reporting a lot of separate little ones, uh, whether you'll know what the difference is. I think the spirit that you do need to know them, they could have an effect. I agree with the 1.5, um, but I plus one to Brad's point about not having because I thought it was report each one of these, then the secretary will tell you if it's caused a change. Seemed burdensome um, across all kinds of institutions, but that may not be the mechanism that's created here. So I think the department should just walk through what it is it wants, in what form, and in what, and whether the institution can know that it has that obligation because the change has happened. That would solve the materiality, the hundred dollar um, item. Any school would be able to say nope, 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 or whoa, we've had many hundreds, and indeed we have shifted. Yeah, I, I agree that the language as written is not clear on that on that uh, in that regard. So we are we are seeking clarification on that. So as soon as I as soon as I get that from uh, um, from uh, our staff, I'll I'll convey I'll convey that to you. But I agree that as as written, it, it's not um, as clear as it might be. So it does require clarification. And uh, Steve, I see your hand as well. Yeah, I, I just want to point out we're certainly open to the comments. What gets reported is actually addressed in section F1. Um, so perhaps the comments should be addressed to that section because that as opposed to because uh, I think this calculation is referring to the department's calculation based on what gets reported. OK, Jessica, I see your hand next. Thanks, I'd like to make two points. First, as to um, previously when Carolyn and Barmack and others were speaking about the withdrawal of owner's equity, I just want to underscore how important this is to students in the closed school situation that I described yesterday. The school wasn't paying its rent, wasn't paying its teachers, it wasn't paying its health insurance premiums for its teachers. It was taking money from students and guess who it was paying? Its principal, right? The students paid out of pocket. They never saw that money again. The Chapter 7 bankruptcy trustee said, it's gone, we can't touch it. And so I think this is really an important protection as schools wind down, and I just want to emphasize that. Um, and I want to briefly respond to Brad on B and C under Romanet 1. I think that the settlements and the borrower defense claims are material to financial responsibility in two respects. One is the direct causation that you are identifying, which is that it could require the school to incur a liability that could itself affect the school's financial status. But there's also an indirect way that there's a causal link there. 
I think that a school that has a tremendous amount of borrower defense claims is at financial risk for a number of indirect reasons. As a school against whom the department has made findings that there is misrepresentation or fraud, that's a school that's likely to have, for example, state law enforcement actions that might result in a judgment. It's a school that might have bad press so that the enrollment drops. It's a school that might have individual private lawsuits that might result in judgment. I, so I think it's very reasonable for the department to have uh, financial triggers that come at an earlier stage of that process because we're not just talking about the direct impact on the bottom line. We're also talking about indirect impacts on the bottom line. And I think the same thing would be true for um, subsection B regarding federal and state settlements. And I think to a certain extent, A, regarding other judgments. May I respond to the question? <laughs> you know, that there is a standard in an accounting language that goes in addition to materiality that's, that's the likeliness to incur. And there's no likeliness to incur here language whether or not you know it's likely that you would have a debt that might be incurred. That that threshold of an accounting, I'll, I'll defer to Dave, is typically over a 50% likelihood. Again, there's just no definition here in either scenario of how likely is it and how material is it um, to be a mandatory trigger. A discretionary trigger, you know, maybe it makes sense to move down below, um, but we're talking about a mandatory trigger on something that may not be likely and may not be material. Okay, thank you, Yael, please. I agree with um, the comments that Jessica just made, and I want to frame them a, a little bit differently. I think, Brad, you may be inaccurately characterizing these triggers, um, or at least speaking about them in language that suggests that they're punitive rather than protective. Um, you know, the goal here isn't to punish schools for any type of conduct covered in these provisions. It's to address what are real risks of financial instability and I think the, the triggering events have been written in a way that, cap, that captures that. But to do that well, the department really can't wait until these types of liabilities are incurred. They need to be able to identify the risks before the liabilities are incurred. Ignoring these types of threats, you know, in the case of a, an enforcement action by a federal or state agency, for example, or after successful borrower defense claims have already been adjudicated, at a significant percentage of, um, of funding would result in basically an entirely deficient assessment of an institution's ability to meet its financial obligations. And it would, I, I would note, also prevent the department from securing financial protection against losses until the point where the school would be considerably less likely to obtain the funds that it would need to provide that. Uh, Greg, I see your hand up. Did you want to respond? Uh, yeah, I'll take that. Um, I, I take that comment. I just want to. I wanted to respond to uh, Jamie's um, previous uh, question for clarification, and then following up on 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 uh, Steve, uh, what Steve said about reporting requirements. So, if you look in the reporting requirements under F, it does say in accordance with. And we're not there yet, but in accordance with the procedures established by the secretary, the institution must notify the secretary of the following events or actions. Um, and and uh, under uh, Romanet one, it says for liability incurred under C one Romanet one A of this section, which is what we were just discussing, um, uh, no later than ten days after the final uh, written notification of the institution of the judge to the institution of the judgment or final determination. So it appears the way it's written, it would require notification, even though the actual triggering event is the uh, Composite score of uh, the recalculated the composite score of less than 1.0. That the triggering event is the actual notification um, of that the event that the event that would I don't want to say trigger, but the event that would require the school to notify Ed is the uh, is the actual um, a notification to the institution uh, of final judgment or determination. So then there's nothing uh, there now that would put a a, a, um, a de minimis amount in. So that appears to be the way it's written currently, but I'll, I'll, I know that there was some uh, some objection to that, so I'll, we'll take that back and discuss it. All right, thank you. Uh, Amanda, I see your hand next, but I just want to welcome uh, Johnson to the table on behalf of Legal Aid. So Amanda, please go ahead. Uh, 
I think you're muted right now, Amanda. Sorry. I wrote that. <laughs> Clearly not enough days or time with technology, still not learning, um, can make mishaps. Uh, but I, this is more so a question and query as I'm reading this section. Um, I think my, my question kind of comes from this idea of, you know, if the policy goal is to ensure the financial stability of institutions and you're trying to um, insert triggers for me, I, I, I'm hoping that these triggers come at the right opportune time to actually catch the institutions, um, you know, a bit like whether or not they're financially healthy or potentially ending up at a point that's going to end up in a downturn for students. So I'm hoping that the, these, the changes actually come at that right time. And I think figuring out that right time is probably hard to do. Um, but I think it's a, these are creative ways in which you're trying to ensure those triggers are put in place at that right time. So I'm wondering with this question of timeline involved um, so that these regulations are really targeting at the right time um, for you all to then conduct an action against the institution in part C, you know, given that, you know, by the time a secretary has adjudicated claims, it seems as if it takes a long time. A lot of the burden is on the student to produce the evidence. And by the time it's actually, you know, that process has ended up at the department's hand, students have had years of, you know, trying to issue their claim, provide that burden. And I'm just wondering, what is the time? Do you think this trigger is really helpful? You know, at that point, this, you know, this point that says adjudicated claims in favor of borrowers, it's really taken a long time from what we know in the past and what we have cases currently to get. To. So I'm wondering how useful you think that part of the timeline in borrower defense claims is the right time period. I just want to know what your internal thinking was there as a form of a triggering metric, you know, triggering tool. And then second in that part C, um, you state is equal to, you know, you want to make sure that the amount of loans discharged by that specific date is equal or greater than 5%. I'm wondering how you came up with the 5% and why you thought that that floor was the right amount to actually make use of this trigger. Based on past claims um, is, you know, I just want to make sure there's use in this, in this regulation to protect students and to make your, your, your tools actually work as a trigger. So well, I, I think, so to address your question about about um, you know at what point um, with respect to lawsuits where where it becomes a trigger, I think we've tried in, in constructing these regulations, these proposed rules, to strike a balance between um, you know what's fair to institutions and what uh, what the department really reasonably needs to know uh, or reasonably reasonably needs to include uh, in determining whether or not to seek uh, uh, surety from that school. Um, and you'll note that with, for instance, the KETAM lawsuits or those brought by the uh, by the by the state, we uh, we have determined that those are are usually of significant enough um, proportions to uh, to not wait until the uh, until there's been a judgment or, or a settlement. Uh, we we do understand that other lawsuits there there are uh, um, uh, free, you know they that. Entities are sued all the time. That uh, there could be instances where many times where those suits aren't successful. So I mean, this was a this was somewhat of a balancing act, um, and and we, that's where we came down on it. Uh, regarding the five percent, I, I think I would, I might have Steve comment on that. I, I think that that's that's a uh, that's a floor. That's a sort of a uh, um, valid percentage that we use in in some instances. I know we use it for uh, the five percent for determining when um, institutions have passed the threshold for uh, uh, not making timely returns of Title IV funds uh, for um, and, and we've we've used five percent pretty frequently, but I don't uh, I don't know that I know exactly why five percent was chosen in this in this circumstance, except that it's uh, we do have precedent for uh, for using uh, for using five percent. But Steve, could you can you address that? Oh, you're muted right now, Steve. Uh, under the financial responsibility regulations, 
establishing liability, an administrative liability greater than equal, uh, greater than 5% of an institution's annual funding triggers a past performance failure of the financial responsibility standards. So that, that's also the other reason that that's tied here is the financial risk of, of uh, failing those standards triggers the need for surety. Hey, Johnson, go ahead. Hi, good morning. Um, I, I just want to uh, expand a little on what Amanda said that my concern is, you know, doing a borrowed defense application is a huge amount of work and most students don't even know about it until the school is closed. So if you really want C to have any uh, useful uh, application as a, as a, uh, a trigger for um, um, for action by the Department of Education, I think you have to think of a different number. Um, a percentage. I think 5% is way too high, honestly. I mean, just think about if you have a very large for profit, there's one that has 100,000 students in it, you would need to adjudicate 5,000 claims before that would happen. That's a lot of resources by the Department of Education. And that puts the burden on the students to even know about this and to be able to navigate um, all the barriers of filing a borrower defense claim. It's not an easy thing to do. You got to go online. You got to fill out a lot of stuff. There are a lot of questions that are asked. You just, I, I just don't see this ever achieving the laudable goal that the Department of Education wants here, which is to use borrowed of defense to inform them. I mean, I think more likely what will happen if, if it stays like this is borrowed defense will just be informing the Department of Ed or uh, the states as to when to sue. And this, this will be sort of an after, always looking in the rearview mirror uh, rather than something that's uh, being used um, prospectively. And you might want to consider, uh, honestly, um, just the filing of so many claims. Um, I mean, I don't know how you would adjudicate that many involving a large institution in a timely manner. Uh, you have to adjudicate all of them. There are 300,000 claims out there right now that still need to be adjudicated. So, or maybe it's 250. I'm not sure what the number is, but there are a lot of claims that are standing there that need to be adjudicated. So you, you want to respond? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Greg. I'm sorry. I just, want to, I just want to make sure that so what you're suggesting is that that um, it be based on uh, just in a number of filed filed claims or a percentage based on filed claims. It could be that, Greg, or it also could be. I mean, you could look and see what you think is a trigger that really gets everyone's attention and bring it down below that within the Department of Education. Um, I mean, I don't think, honestly, I'm not sure this would protect any students whose schools have closed recently. Um, you know, I, I understand there's a history of bar defense being litigated and what the rule is and how to apply the rule in different administrations and so forth. But I just don't think you're ever going to meet that threshold of 5% until, you know, every uh, news article in the, in the country is slamming the school. I think it's a very, it's a very high, uh, it's, a, it's an easy bar that for schools to not actually have to deal with. It's, it's just, there's too, too much burden here. So I, either way, but I think if you looked at the 5% number, you would probably see that the Corinthians and all that would never have, I mean, I, and borrowed defense didn't exist back then, but I'm not really sure that this would be a useful benchmark. And Steve, anything to add? Yeah, just to add to what Greg said, um, these are mandatory triggers. Right, so if, if this tr if this threshold is crossed, the institution would be required to post a letter of credit. There's also a discretionary trigger that that will be uh, covered when we go further through the document that uh, says that when the secretary has identified a common group of pending loan discharge claims, the department could uh, could require the institution to post surety at that point as well. Uh, we're certainly open to ideas on. Uh, not just a comment saying the threshold should be different, but coming up with a suggestion of what that threshold should be and why uh, would also help our discussions and deliberations on these issues. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll think about whether we can come up with some other threshold that might make sense. I, I take that as an invitation. Thank you. And I was going to come back to the seat. Thank you. Gotcha. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you, Johnson. Uh, Kelly, please. Thank you. Um, first, first, I 
would like to say that the importance of financial responsibility, I think, is very important from, from a number of reasons. One, students should never be in a situation where their school closes. And that's what we're, we're talking about here. Me measures of how you determine whether or not a school is going to close. And I think what we I think what we talked about yesterday a little bit was that the calculation of the score and these triggers are not necessarily doing the job that they need to do in order to determine whether those schools are going to close. And so, you know, as I think about these triggers, whether they be mandatory or discretionary, the question that I would have is, you know, is there evidence that the department can share that shows that these are the right triggers? whether they be mandatory or discretionary, and maybe they should just be triggers in general. Maybe there shouldn't be two different classes of them that would show that the schools that have closed recently or in the past, that these were issues that those schools had. Um, you know, this is important for students, but it's also important for institutions as well from the perspective of they may be financially responsible in the definition of they're not going to close. And they could potentially be getting caught up in some of these triggers, you know, whether it's mandatory or not, that could be very costly for institutions. You know, in reading through this, there's, you know, and we'll get to it eventually, I didn't see necessarily any changes, but in the section as it relates to um, reporting, there's this whole concept of a preliminary determination by the department where a school has the ability to provide information as it relates to any of these triggers that shows that they are financially responsible before that final determination is made. And I hope that that's happening in, in the cases as it relates to these triggers, because it's hard, I think it's hard, at least for me, it's hard for me to provide any real substantive, you know, examples or, or or rationale for some of these because I don't know if this is the reason that schools are closing. So I think, I guess in, in summary, I guess my question is, is there any evidence that shows that these are the triggers that would show that the schools have closed or are closing? I don't, um, I don't know what data, you know, whether we have data on this that the publish as, as um, you know, um, they could actually tie uh, uh, school closures to one of to these events. Um, these these are uh, th these are uh, uh, these are events that um, that we are aware of through our compliance activities that that uh, that have caused instability at institutions. And um, I think you know we need to bear in mind what we're trying to do here is to try to find ways to. Uh, uh, of of identifying where schools may be uh, financially unstable, you know, in, in time to 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 get some type of um, uh, surety from them, you know, uh, before a school were to go to to go on under or close. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know that any one of these is is you know certainly um, we see, for example, that you know the withdrawal of owner equity being a, being a problem. Um, uh, at schools where you know that are financially unstable, where that has caused, uh, you know, where they've taken money out out of the school. Um, I don't. But if you're asking me, do do we have uh, actual data where where there's been a study done that ties it? I don't think we have that. But and I would throw it out to the, to the to the negotiators. If you have, you know, suggestions for other, you know, other types of triggers that you feel may um, may help the department identify. Where a school is is stressed or or uh, in danger of closing, um, we would be open to hearing what those are. These these are the ones that we we have we have identified that we, that we think would. And I, again, I don't think anything is perfect. I don't think there's any way we can find a, a mechanism to, in every case, um, identify that a school might be uh, you know on the verge of closing or or that if a school does close, there was the actual you know what the actual reason was it could have been precipitating events but so i'm not sure that we can we can do that what we're trying to do is come up with the best identifiers possible uh we think we've done a pretty good job here but uh but again we are open to hearing uh from from the uh from the committee uh any other solutions or, or ideas you might have thank you greg I, and i just you know just 
to repeat what I said yesterday, I, I do think that, you know, based on that response and, and the fact that this is not working all the time, and I'm not saying that it's ever going to work all the time because it won't, but the importance of really looking at, you know, the composite score and these triggers as it relates to, you know, schools that have closed in the past and, and why that's happening. And so I guess, you know, if I were to be making a recommendation, I think I would I would say that the, the triggers are important. I don't know if the distinction between a mandatory trigger and a discretionary trigger is necessary, so I would possibly recommend co combining them it just into triggers with the thought that they are preliminary determinations and that schools do have the ability to um, you know, provide data that, that shows that they are financially responsible because not all schools are bad actors and some of them do get caught up in this and end up having to pay substantial amounts of money for, for letters of credit that could be used elsewhere. I mean, I realize that there are bad actors and I get that and, and, and I'm hopeful that those will be identified, but I'm just looking at the other side of it where, you know, as a mandatory trigger, if it's a situation where, you know, we definitely need clarification on A, when it talks about debt and liability, because if it is in fact, that any debt or liability that you incur as a result of that needs to be reported to the department, that is extremely burdensome and not something that institutions are going to be able to do. I can understand it if, it, if that is material enough to affect your score that you would report it to the department, but every single one of those colleges and universities get those every day. And it just there's no way that they would be able to provide that information to the department on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see Brad's hand next. Go ahead. Thank you. And I agree with uh, Kelly's point um, 100%. You know, and going back to what Mr. Finley just mentioned, that we're talking about mandatory triggers that allows the department to require a letter of credit. So the way I read this is just by filing a lawsuit that may not result in a material or likely a result of a material finding would allow the department to require an institution to post a letter of credit. Letter of credits are expensive and, and frankly they can put small nonprofit schools out of business relatively quickly. So again, posting a letter of credit is not something that every institution can just immediately do, especially when it's a 10% threshold of Title IV revenue. So I just want to be clear that having no definition in here of what is material to the institution and then having a, a letter of credit having to be posted is a big deal. Thank you. Uh, I see Barmax hand next. So I, I want to just make some general comments in response to Brad and Kelly's points. Um, there's that great line in the sun also rises where um, one character asks the other one, how did you go bankrupt? And the answer is two ways, gradually and then suddenly. And um, if I were to characterize what the department uh, has done historically and is attempting to do here, uh, the, the composite index, the composite uh, score is the department's um, attempt at detecting going bankrupt gradually. It has done a terrible job of it, and I have enormous sympathy for Kelly and so many nonprofit institutions that pose absolutely no risk just by virtue of the fixed assets they have to the to their students or to the taxpayers of this country that are then burdened by an artificial and rather problematic calculation that forces them to post letters of credit and to to and and makes life expensive for them the triggers we're talking about here these are frankly belated indices of going bankrupt suddenly the hill to die on for the for the nonprofits is 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 the substance of the calculations that generate the composite score all of the practices that are uh, that are now um, proposed as triggers here, or all of the events that are being proposed as triggers here, are almost exclusively concentrated in the most predatory segments of the for-profit sector. 
and and uh, candidly, I find them. I mean, posting a 10% letter of credit, yeah, it's expensive, but guess what? 90 cents on the dollar will have to be covered by the taxpayers when the institution ends up collapsing. So I wouldn't worry too much, Kelly, about this stuff. I do think you have legitimate concern with regard to the to the overarching practices that determine financial responsibility. But these are the, I mean, again, let's not make the theoretical the paradigm here. In practice, what we, we've seen is that these are these are practices that prevail in the worst uh, segment of the for-profit sector. Thank you. Um, not seeing any other hands and recognizing we, we did jump around um, a little bit. Uh, Greg, do you want to do you want to tee us up for just a quick check on the reg text as it exists now so we can move on? Uh, well, yeah. Um, well, do we, I know we have a couple outstanding questions. I hope we do some, some of them at least. Uh, you know, I, I tried to address the, uh, the, the the philosophy behind what we were doing here. And again, I want to throw out to people the uh, invitation to if you have I mean, because we've heard a lot of discussion here about um, the extent to which these triggers um, identify at-risk institutions, and um, obviously the department doesn't have a hammerlock on um, knowledge of all of those. So, so if you have ideas, we we like to hear them. What I'd like to do is walk through, go through the remainder of the of the mandatory triggers. And then when we're done with that, we can have a discussion of the remainder of those triggers just so we can get through this. Uh, we can get through this uh, paragraph. If that's okay. all right. So Aaron, would you like to bring up that document issue paper number four? So we're going to start. We're going to start with teach out plans. And that is Romanet three. It's Romanet three. There we go. So I'll walk through these through the end of uh, of the of the mandatory triggers, and then we can entertain comments, uh, questions at that point. So uh, again, continuing with the mandatory triggers, the uh, institution is uh, required to submit a teach out plan or agreement for a reason described in uh, 602.24 C1 that covers the closing of the institution or its branches or additional locations uh, for state actions. If the institution is cited by state licensing or authorizing agency for failing to meet state agency requirements and the agency provides notification that it will withdraw or terminate the institution's licensure or authorization if the institution does not take any steps to come into compliance. Uh, and then we move down to uh, Romanet 5 for publicly traded institutions. A uh, publicly traded institution is subject to one or more of the following events. And we, we uh, made a few changes there with respect to uh, these are technical changes, um, and you can see here that uh, we we put in a, um, SEC actions under actions that the Security and Exchange Commission uh, might take, and made a couple changes to uh, make sure the terminology is correct. You can see there under under exchange, under exchange action, under exchange actions, the National Securities Exchange on which the institution securities are listed notifies. The institution is not in compliance with the exchange exchanges listed requirements um, or its securities are delisted. So just some some clarification there and also uh, SEC reports the institution failed to require a file a required an annual or quarterly report with the SEC within the time period prescribed for that report or by any extended due date um, under the applicable uh, regulation cited there. Um, under Romanet 6, uh, non-federal education assistance funds. For the most recently completed fiscal year, a proprietary institution did not receive uh, at least 10% of its revenue from sources other than federal educational assistance as provided in 668-28, and that, those are the 9010 regulations. Uh, the surety provided under this uh, requirement will remain in place until the institution passes the 9010 um, revenue test. And this was a, uh, this, as you might recall, this was a, once a discretionary trigger, it would be moved uh, onto the, uh, into the uh, mandatory triggers. Um, we've also moved over the cohort default rate to uh, mandatory trigger. And that remains what it was. Uh, just moved to uh, just moved to the um, uh, mandatory triggers part. 
And we have a new mandatory trigger related to contributions and distributions. This mirrors a particular kind of financial manipulation we have seen from proprietary institutions. In past cases, owners have made contributions to an institution near the end of one fiscal year and then withdrawn those contributions at the beginning of the next fiscal year in an effort to inflate the school's finances before the fiscal year ends. This trigger would apply if the removal of that contribution would mean the school would have a composite score of less than 1.0. So you can see that reflected there. Uh, the institution made a contribution in the last quarter of the fiscal year and then made a distribution during the first two quarters of the next year. So uh, put in the money and then took it out. The removal of such contribution up to the distribution results in a recalculated composite score of less than 1.0. And finally here, um, after the end of the fiscal year in which the secretary has most recently calculated the institution's composite score, um, when the institution is subject to two or more discretion, discretionary triggering events as defined in paragraph D, those events become mandatory triggers. And uh, this is a technical edit to clarify the timing of the existing regulatory requirement, which says that the institution uh, subject to two discretionary triggers becomes subject to them automatically as a mandatory event. So that takes us through the end of mandatory triggers. So I'll entertain any um, comments or questions now before we move on to uh, par uh, paragraph D, Discretionary, um, discretionary triggering events. Yeah, yeah, Greg, I see some hands already, and I just want to note um, Brad and Jamie's comments that that as, as much as negotiators can, just because this is a lot of information, if folks can, as best to their ability, um, uh, withhold comments on later Romanets um, so that we can progress through in, in roughly um, order as they appear in the document. So, so with that, if folks want to maybe start with Romanets three and four, teach out plans and state actions. Um, I'm happy to to open it up. Uh, Aaron, would you bring down the document? Thank you so much. So with that, Jamie, please. Yes, uh, simple suggestion uh, on concern about teach out plans as a mandatory trigger. Um, if an institution um, by choice wisely uh, decides to close a branch or additional location, for example, um, it has to do a teach out plan to show um, how students will be served either by other programs of theirs or by shifting to other institutions. It can be completely innocent. It can be a very wise um, thing done by a thriving institution. To make that a mandatory trigger, I think, is overbroad and could um, have the kinds of effect Barmack was just talking about that are not related to financial health. Um, it's possible that the solution is um, to put it into uh, discretionary triggers or to uh, distinguish teach outs that are related to uh, closing obviously um, belongs there, but closing of a branch or additional location can be a prudent thing done by a healthy institution um, that should not trigger, uh, should not be a mandatory trigger. I do want to point out that, um, so where we say that the institution is required to submit a teach out plan or agreement for its for a reason um, uh, listed in 34 CFR 602.24 C1 that covers the closing of any of the branches or additional locations. And just to clarify what those, um, and I, I don't know if this addresses your entire uh, comment or not, Jamie, but um, so those conditions are for a private institution, the institution's auditor expresses doubt about the school's ability to operate as a going concern or indicates that an adverse opinion or finding of material weakness exists or the accreditor places the institution on probation or equivalent status and or the secretary places the institution on provisional program participation agreement and requires submission of a teach out as a condition of that change of status. So it is limited to those. So I so I should have started my comment by asking what 602.24 C1 Yeah, well, Yeah, and I'll if take some blame. Maybe I should have clarified that when I was going through it, but I but I didn't. Yeah. So I'll take, I'll take Okay, that. if those are the conditions, then that's perfectly reasonable. I thought when you summarized that you were saying um, that it covered anything. Um, yeah, that's that. That's that, that responds to my concern. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jessica, please. Thanks, this might unrespond to your concern, Jamie, but I think that 
the department should consider some of the triggers that are in C2. I think these might have been a part of the last NEGREG that I was on, so I have a vague memory of them. But I think that some of the triggers in C2 are things that would um, make sense, like the agency acts to withdraw, terminate, or suspend the accreditation of the institution. Um, so I just, I don't think it's necessarily worth us talking through each one of those, but I think the department should look at C2 and see if any of those should be considered in addition to C1. We will note that. Consideration of D2. Okay, thank you. Go on <clears throat> Roman F4. Um, again, this is similar to my comment on the, the previous federal lawsuit comment is um, once again, um, you know, if there's an issue between a school and a state, many times the state works closely with the institutions on minor and moderate compliance challenges. And so with there being no materiality threshold here or likeliness to occur threshold, um, this proposal gives state regulators federal power, an aggressive state regulator that wants to put an institution out of business that understands this provision would basically just uh, be able to um, issue a um, compliance binding and uh, all of a sudden it's a mandatory trigger that require a letter of credit. So again, just because the state has uh, issued some sort of notice doesn't should not require a potential letter of credit for being posted. It needs to be likely and needs to be material. Thank you. Well, I think the departments, you know, uh, when we look at this, our, our position is, you know, if in, in reading this, the institution has been cited by the state licensing or authorization authorizing agency for failing to meet state agency requirements, and that agency provides notice it will withdraw or terminate the institution's licensure. So, while I can, I, I'm not saying I, I, I don't appreciate your comment or where you're coming from. I think that. When you have a situation like this, where, where notice has been provided that it intends to withdraw or terminate the institution's licensure or authorization, that means at that point that that school is automatically um, no longer eligible to participate. So um, I think that we have a, a huge interest in, um, in, in, in looking at uh, when something like this happens. I think this is a very serious, this isn't just a run in the mill action by the state. This is a, this is a pretty serious event. So. Um, it, it's something that I think that though it, I, I take your point that it might not ultimately result in that. Um, there is a clear indication that that's a very good possibility. So I think that we uh, need to uh, to uh, be proactive here and in, in a position where we're we're securing the uh, the interests of the federal government and, and also the uh, interests of students attending that institution. To me, I respond so, you know, the state attorney generals outside of higher education, you know, things have gotten uh, pretty political on other issues, and there's all kinds of lawsuits that have been filed with the federal government on various things. So the concern here is, is if you have one state, AG, that gets aggressive to terminate an institution's license for who knows what, they could, you would then be required to post a letter of credit. So again, it is, it is giving states a lot of power here um, under this, the way this is written. So, so I would just add, that, you know, it's, and I'm not, you know, certainly every viewpoint here is is, is welcome. I, I I think that we're not we're not making any judgment here as to the motivations of a of a of, a, of attorneys general. We're simply saying that if the, if this occurs, that the occurrence of it, irrespective of motivation or anything else, is is an indication that that school. Uh, May have its may have its licensure revoked, and that that's not a that's going to be a loss of eligibility for, um, that we need that we need to be aware of and be able to take action on. So, just want to clarify that. But thank you for your comment. We've noted it. Thank you, and thank you, Emmanuel, for for clarifying what the reference to Remnant Three was in chat. But Carolyn, please go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, first, uh, I, I wanted to echo Greg's point that um, the determination by the state agency is going to affect whether this whether a school can continue in Title IV 
regardless. So this is a really, I think, a critical kind of trigger because this would um, pretty much, uh, if, if a school is going to, is risking losing state authorization, that's um, an indication of an enormous risk for um, that the school is going to um, be become uh, ineligible for Title IV. Um, I also wanted to make one further point, which is that all of these triggers, which I think are um, all of them important and um, ex you know significant steps forward in in improving the overall system of trying to detect. Uh, financial problems before they happen. I think they're all useful, but um, in a general comment, they are all only as useful as the protections that are going to be put in place once the trigger happens, which I, I, I sort of mentioned before. Those triggers, as I understand it, um, are set out in a different regulation and they um, uh, pr provide for the department to require a letter of credit when these triggers have been triggered um, to, uh, with the minimum of 10% of the school's uh, Title IV for the year before, if I'm understanding this correctly. Please correct me if that's not right. And my concern is that um, that is not always enough um, and does not look at um, things like uh, borrower defense potential liabilities, which can span uh, more than one year. They can span a, a long or period of time, meaning that the taxpayer uh, or the, the potential liability um, and cost is of a school closing in that situation is quite quite a bit larger than just looking at the you know a small percentage of the Title IV for the year before. So what I, and I'm suggesting is that it would make sense to build into the um, requirements for a letter of credit that um, that the department base the letter of credit decision not only on um, one year's worth of Title IV for for the pre previous year, but also what are the borrower defense liabilities, what are closed school discharge liabilities looking like. Um, are there other outstanding liabilities? Um, because this 10% of one year's Title IV might, might not do it, especially when you're talking about a trigger of like 5% of borrower defense, um, you know, that's already been adjudicated. 30 seconds, Carolyn. Um, that, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great, Barman. Uh, several points. Um, one of them, to go back to Jamie's observation, uh, and even earlier than that uh, to to uh, Kelly's concerns. Uh, it seems to me that posting a letter of credit is entirely unnecessary, even when um, alarming circumstances may otherwise trigger it. If the entity in question has sufficient net identifiable assets exclusive of goodwill to cover its liabilities, and there's no reason if a campus if a campus may have may may have may, ha may be required to post a teach out, but if it has, you know, sufficient land and buildings and other assets, why force it to go out and post a letter of credit when you already know you have enough to go after should something bad happen? That allays some of the sort of unnecessary costs that may push somebody over the line. So that's one issue. I wanted to talk about the publicly traded language here. Um, with regard to SEC actions, I really would, would encourage the department to contemplate uh, far less severe uh, adverse actions by the SEC than uh, revoking registration. Again, revoking registration is, a, is the final nail in the coffin, basically. Uh, but if if you're tying your wagon to that horse, I mean, you know that that's really by the time that happens, odds are the entity is already collapsing without much by way of recourse. So I would suggest there are other adverse actions that may be earlier harbingers of trouble that may that may be better indices for for you to act. Uh, and with regard to exchange action, again, being delisted from a, from an exchange, is is oftentimes uh, sort of one of the final steps uh, in the collapse of a publicly traded company. You recall ITT was trading on pink sheets um, before it uh, before it collapsed. Uh, what I suggest in its place would be to require some kind of market capitalization threshold vis-a-vis -vis federal dollars. Frankly, tuition the unearned tuition dollars at risk. Uh, that would be a better index of uh, where a, where an entity may be extreme trouble than than being delisted by the exchange. 
Thank you. Uh, OK, Debbie, please. I um, I wanted to comment on the state action piece in particular. Um, and, you know, to highlight a couple things that other folks have already said, you know, it feels like what this provision is really getting at is the loss of um, state authorization, which would automatically trigger um, a loss of Title IV eligibility. And, you know, Barmack just described that as the final nail in the coffin. Um, to pick up on something I said yesterday about um, related to gainful employment rule instability, states are the closest to the ground when it comes to school closures. States, as a matter of course, state agencies are not looking to close institutions. Um, because they know exactly uh, exactly what that means for the students and um, and for the other surrounding um, institutions. So I um, you know I, I do want to push back a little bit on on the notion that Brad brought up about kind of states being kind of maybe maybe anxious to to go there. I just don't see that um, in my experience. Um, that said, I, I do think that there are other state agency actions that should be considered in here. You know, states um, may have misrepresentation or fraud um, based on the severity of the, those findings. They may be able to compel refunds for students. Um, and none of those would really, you know, it would it would take a lot for those to get to the point where you know, there's a real threat of loss of state authorization on the table. Um, but I do think, and I completely, I do agree with Brad that there are some state actions that are just not relevant for this purpose. You know, um, you know, uh, late fee payments or um, improperly formatted documents, those kind of things. But if the goal here is really to identify markers of serious problems as soon as we can, so that way we can take appropriate action, I think you need to consider a broader array of state actions here. Thank you. All right, Kelly, please. Um, my comment has to do with the new section contributions and distributions. Uh, Greg, when you introduced this, you, it, you specifically mentioned that this had to do with proprietary institutions. Um, so I would request that that actually be stated in this only because I'm concerned that nonprofits and publics that they don't get pulled into this. So for example, I mean, it talks about an institution making a contribution and then it being dispersed. But if you were to apply it to a nonprofit, for example, and it's not the institution making a contribution, but if you had a donor that made a contribution or a pledge, you could potentially be recording that. And then, God, and this doesn't happen very often, but if there was something that that pledge had to come off the books, then you could, potentially could read into this. I just I want to make sure that this is not the intention of what you're trying to get to here because you did explain it as a proprietary issue. Well, I want to point out that when I described it, it I, I didn't say the regulation limited it that way. I said that, that we put the regulation in there because of practices we've noted, you know, at proprietary institutions where um, owners had put money in and and um, and uh, um, and and and, uh, and and pulled it out. Um, uh, so that's why we did it. I, uh, so you're saying you wanted you wanted it. You think there should be clarifications here for other types of institutions? I'm not certain. Well, when if you're talking specifically about a, a, a contribution being put in and then pulled out, I mean that that's not something a nonprofit would would do. Um, yeah. But you would have a situation where you could potentially have a donor that would that would give a pledge or which would be a pledge, right? And for some reason that has to come off the books at a, at a later period of time. Or you could have a, a situation where, you know, a donor does make a contribution and then that that contribution is dispersed in, you know, the next quarter. So I just, I don't think that the, the intent of what you were trying to do here relates to that, but I just want to make sure that there's not ambiguity as it relates to that. I, in the instance you just pointed out with the donor, I don't know what the effect of that would be. I'll have to take that back with me. And All right. And again, just to remind folks, is if we can keep feedback in, a, in a, an approximate order, um, I think that's probably most helpful for the department. But but please, Yael. Thanks. This feels now like ages ago, but I do need to respond to something Brad said. Brad and Lawson seem to be referring to Romanet 4, I believe, but referenced numerous times actions by state attorneys general. 
So I want to clarify that my understanding of that provision is that it doesn't relate to state AG actions, to state higher ed regulator actions. And with respect to those agencies, I do want to emphasize that there are considerable due process requirements before state licenses can be stripped or other actions like that taken. These actions are not taken arbitrarily. They're not taken for political reasons. Um, and I think it's important to emphasize that. I do want to note that to the extent that Brad's comments were intentionally referring to actions taken by state AGs relevant to the discussion of Romanet 1, um, I want to state again, state AGs have been on the forefront of addressing misconduct by for-profit schools, and we've needed to take these actions, not because they're political, but because they're an imperative for protecting students where federal regulations have not gone far enough. Hopefully, we can help remedy that in this committee. But we have numerous examples of enforcement actions brought against schools that schools have drawn out for years before declaring bankruptcy the moment that a judgment is affirmed. So to the extent that the uh, committee needs this or the department does, I'm, I'm happy to offer those examples, but they certainly confirm the necessity for mandatory triggers related to enforcement actions being filed by state agencies. Thank you. Uh, Brad, please. Okay, yes, it's okay. I'll I'll go to point six, but but Yale is accurate. I misstated AGs on point four when it was about state agencies, but my comment around materiality of the state action, that the state agency still stands. So thank you for pointing that out. On item six, I'm moving past four if that's okay on the 9010. Or would you like to stay through point four at this point, Brady? Uh, well, I'll, I'll turn it to the committee. Does anyone have any uh, anything they'd like to add on um, Romanets three or four? Otherwise, please, Brad, feel free. I'm not, I'm not seeing anyone immediately raise their hands or react. So go ahead. Hey, thank you. Um, on point six, um, there around ninety ten. There's currently regulations already in place that include sanctions for institutions that fail ninety ten. Specifically at uh, 668.29 paragraph C. Uh, further, the failure to comply with 9010 is a proxy, and the failure to make 9010 does not necessarily mean you are not financially responsible. You could be having a very strong financial year and fail 9010. It does not represent any certain measurable impact on the school's financial responsibility, so I believe this should be moved to a discretionary trigger. Uh, obviously, the department feels that it that it belongs as a as a mandatory trigger. I, I do take your points. Um, the uh, failure of ninety ten, though it may not be indicative of of, of a uh, you know of, of severe uh, financial problems on the part of the school, is is an indicate is a uh, an indication that the school uh, may be in danger of um, of losing eligibility due to 9010, uh, to running afoul of 9010. So uh, that is why um, it, we've we've placed it in here because again, these are all indicators of when uh, a school a school ceasing to operate um, would. Are, are, could be imminent, and so uh, a failure of 9010 is is one of those circumstances. So we believe that it that it is appropriate to have it as a mandatory trigger. Um, we will take your we'll note your your objection to that, um, and I would ask if an, if there if anybody else has some um, opinion about that. Is the department's position that it belongs as a mandatory trigger? And then Steve, I see your hand up. If you want to, if you'd like to add anything. Uh, you're muted. Thank you. Um, an institution that fails 9010 for one year may pass the next year. It may not. If it doesn't, it loses eligibility. At the point it loses eligibility, the department doesn't get letters of credit from ineligible institutions. Letters of credit represent surety that the department can use to um, to try to recoup some of the losses that are, that are likely to be associated with an ineligible institution. So, you know, the time to require the letter of credit is is leading up to that year where an institution at least is at risk of losing eligibility. And, and that's the logic underpinning this. 
Okay, Barmak. Um, Steve made a very compelling explanation, which is what I would have also tried to offer, not quite as well. Uh, but I want to go back to Kelly's point about contributions and distributions. I understand the concern about, you know, the, the sort of ambiguity of the term contribution. But even if you consider donations uh, as contributions, certainly refund of donations wouldn't count as distributions. This is clearly related to for-profit capitalization practices. And if the department wants to satisfy everybody by adding that, you know, that in the case of for-profits, that's fine. But I wouldn't significantly alter this because this is one of the ways in which um, people game the system. I would also argue that it should, again, the threshold should be 1.5, not 1.0 uh, for what it's worth. Finally, and I don't know when the right time for this is, in this enumeration of triggers, th there is a significant item missing, which is loss of eligibility for other federal programs due to non-compliance. Uh, particularly those programs that would have consequences for Title IV, say the GI Bill. So at some point, I don't know if that's captured somewhere else or whether you need to add it, but but that's a particularly good trigger because it's, it tends to be smaller amounts and can serve again as an early warning system for bigger trouble coming down the road. So acting on those triggers may be helpful to the department. Thank you. Uh, Brad, please. You um, so on Romanet eight contributions and distributions. Just want to ask if the department has thought about the fact that privately held S corporations taxes flow through an owner's personal income tax return and not through the school's income statement like a C corp. Thus, S corp corporation owners are required to pay quarterly IRS tax payments in order to be in compliance with the IRS law. So. Uh, not allowing contributions to be taken um, or to pay taxes and, and then being in trouble with the IRS does not seem appropriate. Um, so to confirm, and then I also want to confirm with the department, so that's question one. Question two is again, no, no threshold of materiality here. So to confirm us as a school, all schools, not just proprietary, but all schools, are required to notify the department every time there is a contribution or distribution in quarter four or subsequently in quarter one or quarter two. We don't have to report anything in quarter three, but if we make a um, infusion, equity infusion in quarter one, how do we know yet if we're going to make a distribution in quarter one or quarter two at that time? So practically speaking, and this kind of goes back to the, the, the notification of every single lawsuit. I am not understanding how the department is going to be able to, from a burden point of view, keep up with every single in and out without a materiality threshold here. Um, is the department really going to recalculate a composite score every time an equity infusion or equity distribution for nine months out of the year occurs within a school. That happens thousands of times potentially at some institutions. The the provision here is uh, is is uh, placed here, and we believe is necessary to st to stop instances of uh, of gaming um, that we've seen uh, quite frequently with uh, with the contributions being made in the last quarter. Uh, and just to uh, make certain the institution uh, passes and then and then and then withdrawn in the next quarter. So uh, the, the reason it's here is to address a uh, is, is 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 to address the uh, uh, an ongoing uh, concern that we have over uh, what has become a a, a, a a practice that is not at all rare. And uh, so we feel the need to uh, to address that and um, have a mechanism in place. Uh, to to uh, to control for that, we're we're not uh, we're not saying in in these regulations that an institution uh, cannot make a contribution and then remove it. Uh, the uh, the the trigger is removal of such contribution up to the amount of the distribution results in a recalculated composite score of less than 1.0. So I I would disagree that it precludes um, any types of distributions. Uh, rather contributions and then removals. It's to it's to address a certain uh, a certain element of uh, a certain practice rather of of, of gaming. 
And just who would who is responsible for the recalculation of the composite score? Can you clarify that? Because it's not written as it's only to cover gaming, as you as you well, I'll tell, quote you on. It's it is written as that my my read is any contribution or distribution made in nine months out of a fiscal year has to be reviewed. And I, I just want to make sure that's what if I'm reading that correctly. So maybe I'll defer to Steve on this. Yeah, Steve has his hand up. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll yield to Steve. Uh, you're muted, Steve. Thank you. Um, there is a more detailed description of what the reporting requirements are for this provision in Section F. And uh, so I suggest taking a look at those and then we would welcome input on fine tuning them if, from everyone. Uh, Barman, go ahead. Did, I guess. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go, sorry. Go ahead, really, this, section F does not specify thresholds. Am I accurate in that? It, it doesn't specify anything on. The dollar amount, so a ten dollar uh, distribution or infusions would require to be reported, correct? I think it's it's prepared in a different way to trigger the reporting requirements in certain circumstances. We welcome suggestions on ways that you might like to see that modified. Abarmat, please. It's just a quick point that that nothing in this reg prevents anybody from paying their taxes. What they can't do is they can't loot the company to pay their taxes. They should pay their taxes out of pocket like the rest of us. Uh, the notion that that somehow it's an entitlement for uh, uh, a subset of institutions just because of their corporate form to use uh, in, uh, school resources derived from Title IV to pay taxes is just laughable. I mean, I just feel like you know you owe taxes, pay your taxes. You just can't take the money from the school if it results in a deterioration of its financial circumstances below the threshold, which by the way is overly generous here. I again emphasize 1.5, not 1.0. But again, that it just struck me as kind of a false choice to say you either pay your taxes or, or comply with this reg. Oh my God, I think that was directed to me. S corps don't work that way, sir. They, they, they don't. They, the, the taxes generated from income from the school will run through the owner's personal tax return and they are required to take equity distributions to pay those taxes incurred from schools income so that is a factual statement that owners have can they not add new, can they not add new contributions at that point to cover those taxes the taxes are in, were incurred because the school had a net profit so so, so profit so school makes a million dollars you know, they, they, that requires seven or three hundred thousand in taxes. Just keep the numbers around. That three hundred thousand dollars has to be taken out as an equity distribution, unless they just have an extra three hundred thousand dollars in a personal investment somewhere. But that has to come from the school as an equity distribution. And we do have to pay those, those owners do have to pay quarterly estimated tax payments. So that and if that, that weakens is, the institution's finances, you think the taxpayers should take that risk? No, I asked for a materiality threshold, sir. I, I get 300,000 sounds pretty material to me on a million bucks, no? Well, there's $700,000 there hopefully remaining, right? So again, I, I don't want to debate that, but at the end of the day, a C Corp, the taxes are paid directly from the school. And an S Corp, they're paid through the individual. So that's the point of the comment. Well, to, to preclude further, you know, I, I, the debate's interesting, but we, we need we do need to move on. So I, I would say, uh, Brad, if you want to, uh, you know, write up something for us to take a look at uh, about how you feel that that's, uh, that situation is problematic uh, regarding uh, uh, the uh, contributions and distributions, uh, we would be glad to uh, to take a look at that. Okay, not seeing any other hands on through Roman at eight. Greg, do you do you and Aaron want to tee us up just for a quick check if that's helpful for the department? I know there's a lot that is going to be invited in terms of soliciting new feedback and guidance, um, but I did want to give the committee an opportunity just to, to briefly offer their um, support or or lack of support uh, with a quick temperature check. 
Yes. Oh, I just see, I just got a message. Sorry. Um, I see Jamie's hand. Emmanuel, I see your hand as well as up, but I, I don't have your video on right now. So I'm sorry. You, you didn't appear immediately. I didn't see that. I'm sorry. No, I didn't see it. It was my fault. Uh, Emmanuel, please go ahead. I just want to make a comment that, you know, we are all here to make sure as we're looking at financial responsibility that institutions are not precipitously closing and impacting students. And obviously we want to take care of the bad actors. We want to make sure that those institutions that don't have the best interest of students in mind no longer exist. Uh, but we don't want to, by default, punish the good actors who care about students and who want to make sure students have access to post-secondary education, make sure they have access to a quality program, make sure they're able to go out and get that job um, and achieve whatever their dreams are. And with that being said, as I look back to the 2016 rule, 2019 rule, what's being proposed, um, the department has used the 1.0 threshold because even though technically, if you are under 1.5, you are not financially responsible. That is technically correct. There is the zone alternative that an institution can be a part of between 1.0, 1.4, and they have to do certain things such as heightened cash monitoring, those other metrics like that. But they do not have to post a letter of credit. If you're under 1.0, then you have to post a letter of credit of 10% of your Title IV HEA um, funds. However, according to the language here, if you meet a mandatory trigger or discretionary trigger, or if you are not financially responsible in subsection B of the section that we're talking about, then you have to post a letter of credit that is no more than half or not less than half of your Title IV funds. And so I believe the department used the 1.0 composite score threshold because the intent of the department, I can't speak on behalf of the department, I don't work there, but I want to say the intent is not to close institutions down. So the department doesn't want to shut the doors. The department, I would think, wants to get rid of the bad actors. And so if we move that threshold up to 1.5, then you're asking an institution that has under 1.5 to then post letter of credit that is no less than half of their Title IV HEA program funds when they don't have to do that under the regular composite score calculations. In addition to that, I wanted to also share that within the private nonprofit sector, we do have 339 institutions or around that number that have under 250 students. So let's remember that there are institutions out there that are really good actors that are small, that are tuition dependent, and that could get wrapped 30 up in seconds, things, Emmanuel. as my colleague Kelly had mentioned with clarifying some of the language under contribution, contributions and distributions. So I know that we don't want to penalize institutions by literally shutting them down when we have these additional layers of credit being added. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And Jamie, I see your, your comment in chat. I think your comment is relevant because I think what we're, what we're going to move on to next is those discretionary triggering events. So, so please. Okay, thank you. Um, number two strikes me as interesting and dangerous. Um, it reads, um, although I'm um, not the poet that Barmack is, as two rights do not equal a wrong. Um, I can so easily imagine two discretionary triggers that the secretary in his or her discretion would determine uh, were not areas of concern about an institution. <clears throat> It doesn't seem logical for them to the the fact that they both happen um, in a cycle to become a mandatory trigger for risk protection. For example, um, we've seen uh, enrollment drops in institutions around the country after um, natural disasters like hurricanes, fires, and in our case, typhoons. Um, and an institution could also have a planned closure and teach out um, that is fully um, uh, intentional and a very constructive uh, action in which uh, no students um, were, there was no risk and no students were hurt. To have the combination of those become a mandatory trigger when the secretary has determined that they are each innocent seems odd. And in those cases, a triggering, I understand unless a triggering event is resolved before a subsequent event, but you can't resolve the, the effect of the typhoon on enrollment um, you can continue to manage the institution effectively. Um, so in the absence of those being problems, I'm puzzled. Maybe that I should just do it as a question to the department. 
what were you trying to accomplish with two um, uh, discretionary triggers being um, a, a creating a mandatory trigger? And I realized that some of this language is old and maybe you have experience um, with its implementation. Uh, thank you. Yeah, this is this is uh, this is not a new uh, one. This is we did make some clear some clarifying changes to it. Um, you know, uh, 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 multiple discretionary triggers is 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 an indication of there being they are discretionary triggers, but they are nonetheless uh, indicative of, uh, of 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 problems. So uh, you know, where where more than one exists, it's you know our belief that that raises it to a different level but we'll certainly take back your uh, your concerns and uh, and comments about that yeah i guess the question is, should the secretary have the discretion to determine whether those two each one by itself would not be a problem but as a matter of discretion determine whether it becomes a mandatory problem okay thank you sure okay uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, Greg, is it helpful now just to, to briefly re requeue the document? Just um, again, with the acknowledgement that there is a lot of back and forth, I just think it might be helpful. Something to yeah, Aaron, Aaron can bring it. Yeah, Aaron can queue it up. Great. Thank you, Aaron. All right. Is everyone clear on what the department is soliciting uh, your your expression of approval or lack of approval on in this temperature check? I don't think we're there quite yet. Unless Greg, do you want to move to discretionary, or do you want to take a quick check on? No, let's do a check on mandatory discretion. That's that's an awful lot going through mandatory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's let's, let's do point. mandatory, and then we'll move on to discretionary. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a lot. All right, so um, if everyone wouldn't mind just a brief show of thumbs again. Thumbs up is is support sideways. You can live with it. Thumbs down serious reservations. Just just a quick uh, read on where the committee is on uh, this. This section mandatory triggering events. In the center of the frame. Yeah, as much as possible. All right, I'm seeing a number of thumbs down. Um, but we, we have heard folks' objections, but but you are, are welcome to come off of mute if you have anything new to add um, for the department to consider uh, when they take when they take back um, this document. I just said, and I know I've said this already, but my only reservation, and maybe it's just that I didn't necessarily understand the clarification is it has to do with the debt liabilities and losses and just making sure that it's not having to report every single one of those unless it affects the composite score. All right, appreciate it. Um, so with that, Greg, are you ready to go uh, and Aaron ready to go to the next section, which would be discretionary trigger events? That'd be subparagraph D. Yeah, yes. Sorry. So just to reiterate, we're going to uh, look at discretionary triggering events. Uh, there are a number of them. And what I propose to do is uh, to go through them all. There, as I said, there are quite a number of them, but in the interest of time, I'll go through them all and then uh, we'll have an opportunity to comment uh, on them or for any uh, questions, any, any other type of, of discussion. I would like to go, uh, Back to something Brady suggested that when we do that, we try to go through it in order in the order that they are uh, that they're uh, that they appear in the rate in the proposed regulatory text. That way, we can uh, keep some order, and it's I think a lot easier for the people at the department who are, are taking notes on all this uh, to to keep that straight. And if you have comments about something later on, you know, make a note of those and, and make those comments when uh, when we get down to that when the discussion moves to that section. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll start and go through these. Um, so looking at the discretionary triggers, um, we see the first, uh, the first uh, change here is the crediting uh, agency actions. 
we are revising an existing discretionary uh, trigger for accrediting agency actions. While probation actions would technically be covered by the teach out agreement and the mandatory triggers, we include both probation and show cause for equivalent actions uh, because not all agencies use uh, consistent terminology. So the uh, institution was is placed or was is or was placed on probation or issued a show cause order or placed on an accreditation status that poses an equivalent or greater risk to its accreditation by its accrediting agency for failing to meet one or more of the agency standards. Moving down to two is a violation of a loan agreement. And uh, this is maintaining uh, a, uh, a, an existing discretionary trigger related to violations of loan agreements, so I, I uh, uh, won't uh, go into that one. You'll note that the uh, uh, state authorization and 9010 triggers have been moved to mandatory triggers, so they are removed from uh, the uh, text related to discretionary triggers. Fluctuations of Title IV volume. Uh, now there's a significant fluctuation between consecutive uh, award years or a period of award years in the amount of direct loan or federal Pell Grant funds or a combination of those funds received by the institution that cannot be accounted for by changes, changes in those programs. And this is a discretionary trigger that's been added back, uh, previously included in the 2016 borrower defense rules related to fluctuations. Uh, we feel these fluctuations may be indicative of significant enrollment declines, which have often preceded uh, college closures. Or may be associated with aggressive recruiting uh, practices uh, that would manifest uh, themselves in, in great increases in numbers. The next one uh, is uh, four, which is uh, high dropout rates. Um, high annual dropout rates is calculated by the secretary. Uh, we have maintained the discretionary trigger on high annual dropout rates, an element included in the HEA related to selection of institutions for program reviews. Uh, we often see uh, precipitously high uh, withdrawal rates from schools that are on the verge of uh, closing. Five is interim reporting. This is a new discretionary trigger, allows the department to seek financial protection on the basis of additional and interim financial reporting, which schools may be required to do if they are in certain statuses with the department and have concerns about the school's uh, financial circumstances or compliance with uh, financial responsibility rules. So for an institution required to provide additional financial reporting to the department due to a failure to meet the financial responsibility standards in subpart L or due to a change in ownership. There are negative cash flows, failure or of other liquidation ratios, cash flows that significantly miss the projections submitted to the department or withdrawal rates that increase significantly. Moving on to six. The secretary has pending claims for borrow relief discharge under 685-206 and has formed a group process to consider those claims under 685-402. And this is a restored and revised discretionary trigger related to a large number of outstanding borrower defense claims. This revision means that secretary may utilize this claim when he has opted to form a group process to consider borrower defense claims indicative of a sufficient number of serious of, of uh, serious uh, a, a su sufficient number of uh, claims. The group process was negotiated in the department's rulemaking that wrapped up last year and the details will be forthcoming in the uh, in the NPRM. Um, the institution uh, discontinues a significant share of its academic programs. And finally, or the institution closes most of its locations or obtains approval from the department to close most of it, most or all of its ground based locations while maintaining its its, its online operations. Uh, we've added this discretionary trigger uh, for discontinuation of a significant share of academic programs which may occur prior to the closure. And the second uh, element there relates to 
closure of ground-based locations while still maintaining a, uh, an electronic uh, uh, or an online process. And again, these actions uh, may precede the closure of uh, large chain institutions. So we're concerned uh, about the uh, instances where that occurs. And the department would utilize both claims on a discretionary basis. So that is, uh, those are all the elements of uh, discretionary triggers. So at this point, we'll open up the floor for discussion or questions. Thank you. Yeah, Aaron, if you wouldn't mind bringing down the document. And Brad, I appreciate your suggestion for the mandatory triggers. If, if folks want to uh, maybe focus on one and two right now, um, and feel free to post in chat, either, you know, just so I, I can remember, I have a comment on four or five or something like that, um, just to keep us roughly in order. Um, but with that, uh, Jamie. Thank you, Robert. Um, accrediting agencies um, uh, I believe that the first item is a wise change. This moves from show cause as the baseline for an accreditor action that would be a discretionary trigger um, to a more earlier in the process um, or um, a, a more um, a, a less, even le less rigorous than show cause by moving one step forward toward probation or equivalent action. We think that makes sense. Um, accrediting agencies have the job of um, looking forward. Um, financial and responsibility and composite scores, um, audits and ratios are by definition historic. Um, accreditors take very seriously our responsibility for looking at financial sustainability looking forward and at risk and student protections. And we can look at things like governance and board expertise, financial plans, um, plans for debt, um, realistic enrollment projections or unrealistic enrollment projections, history and trends for the institution um, and what's happened to other institutions um, with, um, that we think um, may help us understand what the trajectory of an institution might be. Um, accreditors have been adding new financial tools and frequency. WASC, for example, takes an annual look at uh, financial issues uh, for all of our accredited institutions. Uh, but the combination of um, what the secretary can do on the financial responsibility scores, plus the ability to take into account on a discretionary level, um, probation and other sanctions um, make sense as the department is so um, actively seeking ways to get out ahead of and predict uh, when financial risk exists. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Jessica, please. Thanks, Jamie. I just wanted to make a, a point that's largely in line with that, but just at one level up, which is I think that um, these discretionary triggering events are very important. I'm very glad the department has given more of them. And I just want to point out two things. One is discretionary is discretionary. Obviously, the department at any time, if these become nonsensical, can decide not to use them as a triggering event, right? So the, the department is just giving itself discretion to move against, I think we're calling bad actors. Your school is likely to precipitously close, um, including in circumstances that we might see in the future um, that would be covered under here. And I would note um, also that the subsection B itself, that we skipped over that and just went into the subsections has um, some limiting language there. So that it looks to me as if the department has to make a finding that the event is likely to have a material adverse effect on its individual condition. I think, again, that should assuage some of you that the, it, the discretion is cabined and, and would be applied in ways that make sense. And I think, Jamie, I haven't read this before you made your last point, but that might go to your last point about the combination of discretionary factors. And if something similar to that would be able to written into the, the combination of two discretionary equals and mandatory, then I think that might exclude the situation that you're talking about. So there might be an easy fix there for the department. Uh, Jamie, I see that your hand's still up. Is it a holdover from your, your prior comment? Okay. Um, 
Okay, not seeing anything else on one and two. Any any comments from the committee on uh, fluctuations in Title IV volume or high annual dropout rates? Uh, Marvin, please. Yeah, I think Emmanuel was first. Oh, was he? I apologize, Emmanuel, please. Thanks, Marvin. I was just going to say um, a concern here is the two mandatory or two discretionary triggers equaling a mandatory trigger. I do appreciate the language that says um, likely to have a material adverse effect on the financial condition. However, if the department hasn't had the opportunity to determine whether or not it actually has that and an institution happens to fall into two of these discretionary triggers, then it's automatically mandatory and then, they're, then they have to post a letter of credit that's at least half of their Title IV HEA funds. And I think that's problematic. So hopefully the department can just explain a little bit more of when they make that determination and how that then equates with the two discretionary equals mandatory. And another thing I like to highlight, and we're going we're gonna to get to this later, is in section 668.175 subsection C, there is a language that arguably contradicts the two discretionary triggers equals one mandatory because this language here in the section, when we get to it, does say that one of any of the following in the mandatory trigger section in the discretionary trigger section will then mean an institution not financially responsible. So I want to highlight that, but I know we'll talk about that later. Thanks. And Steve, I see your hand if you want a, a response. No, I was just going to ask uh, Emmanuel for some clarification. Where where are you seeing the reference to the mandatory 50%? Because I, ju I just want to make sure we're not talking apples and oranges here. Failing financial responsibility triggers, usually just triggers a letter of credit of at least 10%. And yeah. there, there is a provision that says you can post a 50% letter of credit or, or higher to demonstrate that you are financially responsible, mm -hmm. but, uh, but that's usually a, a separate issue. Yeah, Steve, that's a great question. It's on page 21, um, section 668.175, subsection C, financial protection alternative for participating institutions. It reads that a participating institution that is not financially responsible, either because it does not satisfy one or more of the standards of financial responsibility, and it lists section 668, 171, B, C, or D. So that is literally the mandatory triggering section or the discretionary triggering right. section or the section before that that just explains financial responsibility. It says that that institution then would have to submit an irrevocable letter of credit that is acceptable and payable to the secretary um, for an amount determined by the secretary that is not less than one half of Title IV HGA program funds. Right. So, so this is an area where we can clarify uh, this issue. 175 people, institutions that meet the standards in 175 are financially responsible. Failing the financial responsibility triggers and participating with a letter of credit of at least 10% with provisional certification is the option available for for institutions that fail the financial responsibility standards so everything we're talking about this morning is a letter of credit at least 10 of at least 10 percent right if you meet 175 you are financially responsible you can qualify to be fully certified and you're posting a letter of credit of at least 50 percent exactly so in order to be financially responsible if you do not satisfy one or more of the standards that includes mandatory standards or discretionary standards, then you have to post a letter of credit to be considered. And that's been that way for years. That's nothing new. So I'm bringing that up with the committee because as we're talking about mandatory triggers, which is not, so mandatory triggers and discretionary triggers came up in the 2016 Obama regulations. Before that, there were no triggers. So that's why people were so upset in 2016 because of the idea of triggers and it was new to people. But now this has been on the books for quite some time. So with this language here and talking about triggers and the fact that two discretionary will equal one mandatory. And if that is the case, in order for an institution to then be considered financially responsible, they have to post a letter of credit because of those triggers and meeting them of at least 50 percent. That is concerning because or, or they can. I just want to make sure we, we all understand. They may also participate as an institution that's provisionally certified with a much smaller letter of credit. So right. this doesn't mean this is the only option available to them. And that's what I was afraid some people were understanding earlier based on your remarks. OK, can you just correct me if I'm wrong, though? The provisional certification piece is only if they follow a 1.0 of a composite score separate alone 
No, the, then, if you hit a trigger, you, you can be provisionally certified and provide a letter of credit of at least 10% as well. You fall in the category of a, an institution that's not financially responsible. But that's only if you're recalculating the composite scores below 1.0. No. OK, and there you can have an institution that hits a trigger like past performance, which has nothing to do with the composite score. It's a mandatory failure of the financial responsibility standards, and that one cannot be cured by posting a 50% letter of credit because it's a mandatory failure. But all these other things we're talking about could be cured by posting a 50% letter of credit, but the institution will have the option to be provisionally certified with a letter of credit of at least 10%. So it's, it's not the cliff effect you're describing unless it's very important that the institution want to be financially responsible. And, and you know, meet that separate criteria. And I, I if that was confusing, I apologize, but I, I hope it was clarifying the issue. Thank you. OK, hey, thank you. Um, Marvin, now I see your hand, please. Yeah, I, I was just. I'm curious about fluctuations in Title IV volume and do, do fluctuations mean increases or decreases? And is there a percent you have in mind or a dollar amount you have in mind or are you trying to be deliberately vague um, about that? And then I, I wonder if um, changes is in enrollment could impact fluctuations and whether you should be specific on that in that uh, statement, but it just that paragraph confuses me. <laughs> well, it, it's it's an acknowledgement of uh, the reality that large fluctuations um, from year to year in in um, in uh, the amount of loans uh, and 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 Pell volume, Title IV volume in general can be indicative of there being problems at the institution and you know so you know either significant enrollment declines or or, uh, or increases we, we key it to title four uh because that's principally what we're you know what we're interested in is you know um the administration of the title four programs and title four volumes so we key it to that but yes i think that certainly an increase or a decrease and we'd be looking at either one could could certainly tie to uh, to increases in enrollment or or decreases in enrollment, but we have we have keyed it to volume. Um, we don't give any um, uh, specific percentage increase or decrease that would uh, that would uh, cause us to uh, invoke this this trigger. Um, if if there is any. Uh, if if there's any interest in the floor on the part of the, you know from the floor of proposing something or or or, or suggesting that we should have uh, something else here, uh, we would be willing to entertain that. However, we do feel that we need to have this um, this discretion to look at where these large uh, these large fluctuations occur, and and then you know because they don't just occur in a vacuum. There's generally something behind a, a large fluctuation in volume like this. Uh, Armand, please. Um, with regard to fluctuations, you know, some of these enrollment changes may be at attributable to external causes, the macro economy, pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. So you may want to, you may want to sort of limit it to anomalous uh, fluctuations or fluctuations that may be attributable to external factors, but that have a material adverse effect on the finances of the institution for, for what that's worth. Uh, I actually had a question uh, with regard to the letters of credit. Um, and, and it's a sort of it's somewhat hypothetical because obviously you have to assume that the if you if we could for a moment assume that the composite score is actually adequate uh, that it that it uh, that it's uh, that it's sufficiently predictive of stability or lack thereof as to serve the purpose for which it was devised the question becomes why uh, you, you why would you create a path of least resistance 
for an otherwise unqualified entity to come into the casino with 50 cents on the dollar and be fully certified, or worse yet, allow an otherwise un ineligible, unqualified entity to come in with 10 cents on the dollar. That just strikes me as really, really risky. It's unbelievable to me. And more importantly, I would point out that there seems to be no adjustment over time. Vaterot was on provisional for a full decade, I understand, on the basis of a 10% letter of credit from a decade earlier. Uh, I mean, that's just, it, it, uh, I just need some explanation of why it is. <clears throat> we talk about standards of financial responsibility. To put it very plainly, I suspect, and it's too bad that Congress tends to invent terms, but financial responsibility has to have a meaning. And I suspect the plain English meaning of it is creditworthiness for the totality of the liabilities, including unearned tuition, not just federal tuition, just unearned tuition on the books. So again, assuming that the composite score, which I know it doesn't quite do this, but if the composite score were to be deemed an, an adequate predictive tool, why would the department satisfy itself with 50 cents on the dollar for a full satisfaction and 10 cents on the dollar for provisional satisfaction of financial responsibility? I'll, I'll, I'll take that and then I'll turn it over to Steve if he has anything else to add. I would, I would point out that these are long established thresholds that we're not, we, we don't propose to change in, in these regulations, which in and of itself doesn't, you know, is not necessarily um, indicative of, of anything, but they, but they are, uh, they are established. I, I just, I, I, I disagree uh, that if, I mean, w with the assertion that a 50% letter of credit is not a, you know, it's not a. I mean, oh, you can say fifty cents on the dollar, but it's a. Uh, that that's a major thing for an institution to get fifty. Uh, fifty percent of its volume. That's that's quite a lot. I don't. And I'll. I'll. I don't. I don't. I don't work in that division where they do that. But Steve is probably more aware of how many institutions actually go that route as opposed to seeking the other. Uh, the other means of. Uh, of. Uh, uh, available to schools, which is the ten percent letter of credit and provisional certification. As Steve just described, but I, I think with the, with the, with the latter, that is, with the provisional certification, we do have quite a lot of uh, leverage on the school uh, once it's uh, provisionally certified. Uh, we can decline to to fully certify it again. So we, I, I think that there is a, a quite a lot of protection there. And then with the fifty percent, I, I do uh, I do believe that's a significant uh, letter of credit. But I'll I'll turn it over to Steve if he wants to make any further clarifications regarding that. I won't add a lot to you except to say that I appreciate the question being asked periodically because it's important. And I, th I think it's important to understand that a letter of credit is different than an assurance that an institution has the resources that could be accessed if needed to pay liabilities, right? Letter of credits, funds on hand, available on demand to the secretary to satisfy uh, liabilities arising under the Title IV programs. And um, the smaller letter of credit, as Greg noted, is, is in conjunction with the provisional certification, which also greatly um, in increases the department's ability to remove a, a bad actor uh, by revoking its approval instead of terminating its approval through um, a more formalized hearing, administrative hearing procedure. Um, why, it, why is a 50% letter of credit enough? And, and this, this was the amount that was uh, determined in the past as being acceptable. And as Greg notes, very few institutions actually choose this option compared to providing the smaller letter of credit in conjunction with the provisional certification. But I think it's a, it's a, it's kind of like a great bedrock question to ask about this whole structure for financial responsibility and how the department tries to mitigate the financial risks. Thank you. Uh, Brad, please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I agree with several of the comments in the chat and, and I'll be brief because I made the same comments in the administrative capability section, but the, the vagueness and the fact that you can't measure several of these statements, see how any school 
can operate under these thresholds when it could require or two of them require a letter of credit to be posted. Just a couple of them here. Fluctuate is in Title IV. What is a significant fluctuation? The definition of that high dropout rates. What can what specifies a high dropout rate? Do they vary by by uh, segment in our industry? Uh, uh, you know, discontinuation of a significant share of academic programs. What what is uh, significant? Is that greater than fifty percent? What is the definition there? Pending borrow defense claims. Like I mentioned earlier, if it's pending, there's no actual liability that's been incurred. So. And we'll propose language. I did have a broader question for the department when we're talking about what is in mandatory and what is in discretionary. You know, the department, you know, can you discuss uh, why we move triggers between the two? And two years ago, you know, this is two years after the current triggers and regulations took effect. Is there any data to support that the, the triggers we put in place two years ago didn't work? That we need to make these moves? But what what is the data behind? What makes it mandatory? What makes too discretionary? And how did you fall in each bucket? Greg, any immediate response? Uh, well, there's no doubt about the fact that, you know, um, which are, you know, uh, when we look at what are, which are mandatory and which are, are discretionary, that there's, that there's some element of, of, of policy discretion there, you know, what based upon, uh, uh, what the department's seen um, out there, what we uh, what we feel is necessary to safeguard uh, the uh, the, uh, the interests of uh, the programs, taxpayers, and students. Um, I don't know that we have, you know, was there was there actual statistical data on which all this was based? Um, uh, no, but certainly the uh, the. The experience of people who are involved in um, financial oversight of institutions and are out there in, in, in compliance is, uh, is is extremely valid. And I, and I would point out and I would reiterate that with all of these that um, the position the department's in, um, we have billions of dollars of risk with uh, with these with these programs, um, and uh, we are we are held accountable for um, you know instances where. Uh, we did not properly um, or, or or it's been suggested that we didn't do enough to fit, to, to determine when an institution was going to close these these closures are uh, put thousands of students out on the on you know out, out of their education on the streets so to speak and uh, create a great deal of disruption require us to uh, in many cases discharge millions of dollars of loans so i think that the department has a compelling interest in in um in, in having uh, and again, not to suggest all these are perfect, but to uh, to have uh, triggers that can help us to uh, get some some surety in advance. Obviously, it's been pointed out it doesn't it doesn't cover all of our losses or all student losses, but uh, but I think these are reasonable. Um, we, we could argue all day over what over what a uh, uh, what constitutes significant or what constitutes high, and and uh, and, and it's true that there is a certain level of discretion uh, involved here, especially with discretionary triggers. Uh, we we do say, as has been pointed out, that we look for these to have a materially adverse effect on the financial condition of the institution, and that that too is uh, is subject to discretion. But I don't think that we can remove all of that. Uh, discretion from these regulations. Um, we're open for any suggestions people on um, anybody from the table has about it, but um, you know a lot of this is just uh, protections we feel we need to safeguard these uh, safeguard these these programs. Thank you. So Sam, I see your hand and, and then I'll invite any feedback for the department on items five and six. Uh, so Sam, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I also want to address that Point about fluctuations in Title IV income. It's still unclear to me um, whether that includes both increases and decreases. I also want to say I, I'm not inclined to put restrictions in to, to make a strict definition for that or dropout rates. I appreciate the discretion that the department needs to look at these factors in combination with each other. But then I worry now with two discretionaries triggering a mandatory, could this trip up a, a good actor? Um, as an example, I 
many, many, almost 30 years ago, worked at an institution that was all female when I started working there and made a decision to go co-ed. Very small institution, um, still still open and viable, you know, by all definition, a, a good actor and respected regional ins institution. But it increased significantly Title IV when the enrollment increased by adding um, male students. And so are increases a trigger here on Title IV? And is there an opportunity to explain uh, what that was for? Because I could see how, uh, it's unclear to me if an increase is detrimental to the department when it's advantageous to the institution. Probably so for bad actors, but not for good actors. Yeah, to answer your question, it is both it, fluctuations involve both increases and decreases, and I and, and and the department's not suggesting that every every fluctuation is indicative of is indicative of a problem. We're simply saying it may be indicative of a problem. Um, so uh, I, we take your point um, that, and we and we look typically uh, this would be looked at. Well, we you know if it was a huge fluctuation in one year, we might we would look at it. Or over the course of years, um, obviously. Um, when department uh, compliance officials are looking at these fluctuations, they, they would they would be uh, in contact with the institution and looking at the institution's explanation for why those fluctuations occurred. So it wouldn't be it wouldn't be done in a vacuum. Uh, we wouldn't just look at it and go, oh, there's a fluctuation. Uh, we're going to go out and um, and uh, require a letter of credit. All right, thank you, uh, Jamie. Please. Um, since I was part of um, asking those questions about the definitions. I think Sam made a lot of my um, uh, points about not wanting to take away the secretary's ability. This is discretionary by the secretary to say, um, and the department, that we see a potentially troubling um, dropout withdrawal or uh, enrollment fluctuation. Uh, so it's, uh, on my part, it's not an effort to tie the secretary down, but if it is something that should be watched, by multiple reviewers like states and accreditors, it might be useful to know what, how the secretary uh, uses that or looks at it. Is it truly a very individualized situation um, that's fairly extreme? Or if there are charts or definitions that are used to get at that, might there be value in sharing those or pointing those out? But I think the fact that an institution has the opportunity to say, ah, yes, we had a substantial decrease, but we believe it was temporary or crisis. Or uh, it is true that upward fluctuations can can be troubling for a number of regulatory reasons. The institution has to have the capacity to support it. Um, it has to you know, fit with what they're doing. Uh, it has to be well planned um, and um, and realistically priced in order to maintain a stable institution. Uh, so. I think it's appropriate that it go both ways. So I don't think it's a problem, but it could be an opportunity for uh, interchange or alerting others of us uh, to what uh, what might be problematic um, and institutions to know what they might need to respond to uh, if there is a if the secretary triggers a question or concern. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Um, any other comments on on uh, discretionary triggers? Uh, anything on on seven or eight or anything that has not been uh, mentioned yet? Would welcome folks to to hop in. Otherwise, Greg and Aaron. Oh, seeing Amanda. Yeah, please go ahead. I know there was questions in the chat, but I just kind of want to have an out loud conversation and just have it in the record, just so for those in the public who can't really see the chat. Um, in the discretionary section for item four, high annual dropout rates, I'm wondering, um, you know, this this stipulates that it's high, high annual dropout rates are calculated by the secretary. Um, I'm just wondering, how does the secretary calculate this? Like, what systems does it use to calculate? And how does it define dropout rates? Is that like what is their definition? Is that retention rates? Does that include withdrawal rates? How broader defined do you um, 
make that definition of dropout rates. What is high? Is there a threshold for that? I know there's different questions in the chat related to this specific item, but um, I just wanted to see if there was a quick response just so that if we can provide additional recommendations here or help with providing a definition that's clear and potentially more suggestions on how to expand this part um, so that it actually targets it's a trigger, especially for triggering or finding out um, if there are higher dropout rates, for instance, um, disaggregated by race and ethnicity or even for Pell Grant recipients or first generation students. I think that's another, you know, that would be a suggestion here um, that we can write on submit, but just on the former questions, wondering if there's a quick response there. On definitions. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of the, so if you, what you're asking is, is where this has been, um, where this has been made a, a, an issue, uh, what was the calculation used? I, I don't know exactly. Steve, do you, do you know what the uh, calculation used, what, which calculation uh, formula was used for that, determining that? Because I, I can go back and find out for you. It's a, it's a good question. Um, I don't think we have any uh, a, a prescribed threshold for it, but uh, as far as what what um, what formula we use to, to the uh, the calculation, I'm, I'm not aware off the top of my head. I'll have to inquire about that. No problem. Thanks, Greg. Um, but hopefully, you'd be or the education department would be would say that you're inviting us to help help also maybe expand this part. We welcome. We certainly welcome any suggestions um, uh, to us. Uh, with okay, great. Uh, I just love to hear that. Yeah. Uh, yes. Always an invitation. Always. Jessica, please. Thanks. This is just a minor point on number six um, related to what Johnson was talking about this morning. I think that there, I, I, I really think the department should, as Johnson does, strongly think about adding a number of borrower defense claims as a mandatory trigger. But if it doesn't, I think it should consider adding that as a discretionary trigger in addition to what is here in number six. They're, they're, they're similar, right? Because Obviously, the secretary would decide to do a group, group dish if there has been a set of claims, but I don't think that the secretary should have the discretionary to make that a mandatory trigger only if the secretary has also used his discretion to make it a group discharge. There might be circumstance or a group process. There might be circumstances where one but not the other makes sense. And so I would just make um, if the department, again, I, I think you should please consider doing mandatory, but if you don't, I think that number six should have an or there and include. A, a number of claims maybe by enrollment. It probably doesn't make sense to do by loan volume since there's no dollar figure yet, but whatever makes sense. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Yael, please. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on that point. I agree. I think it adds two levels of uh, discretion unnecessarily, right? So the formation of a group process is discretionary, though I recognize that the proposed language about state AG requests um, makes it into a final rule that there's a presumption that a group will be formed. But but that aside, it seems like given our history of how long it's taken the department to consider group claims submitted by state AGs where we've laid out in painstaking detail similarities between students, um, just taking that history for what it's worth, the department made spend some amount of time considering whether or not to form a group or the bounds by which it will decide which borrowers are in which group that may uh, be affected by considerations that shouldn't affect whether or not the department can consider a volume of borrower defense claims as a discretionary trigger. I'm thinking as well in the context of receiving, you know, requests from state AGs that outline a significant volume of claims in the period of time between the department receiving such information from the state and actually going ahead and forming a group under that under that section. So I agree with Jessica. I think there should be some language added to allow the department to consider number of claims, even in the context of a group not having been formally formed yet. So I just make sure what's being asked here. So as currently it says the secretary is pending claims for discharge and has formed the group process. So you would be you're suggesting that even even where uh, let's say a group wasn't formed that there was a certain uh, number of claims. 
Potentially. I mean, just to give an example, a group might be might be formed for specific cohorts, right? You might pick specific programs at an institution for specific years where the claims are are similar, right? Um, but you might also still have received many claims from borrowers across programs for different cohort years. I imagine that the department's consideration about how to form a group may require uh, decisions and time that don't impact the question of whether or not the presence of a large volume of borrower defense claims is a problem that should be taken into consideration as a discretionary trigger, right? You might ultimately form multiple groups for the same institution in, in cases of uh, misconduct that spans across different programs and different cohort years. So, you know, yes, yeah, so it's to give the, to, to sort of follow along with the goal of giving the department discretion to consider things that are relevant here, I think the department has a little bit more discretion in this area. Thank you. All right, great, thank you. Um, Greg, if, if you and Aaron want to tee up uh, the discretionary triggers, uh, we can we can get a quick read on where the committee is on on this again with okay. the, uh, the ever present invitation for more um, dialogue and uh, uh, modifications that the department can consider. So we're looking at uh, subparagraph C one through I believe eight. All right. These are all in the D. Paragraph D. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Correct. Sorry, not C. D. Um, so, with that, Aaron, if you wouldn't mind bringing down the document. Thank you. Uh, and again, if, if I could see everyone's thumbs nice and high. All right. Seeing at least one thumb down uh, again, invite folks to come off of mute if there's anything new that they want to add to to this piece. But right, thanks, appreciate it. Um, OK, great. Thank you for that discussion. Uh, and Greg, I'll turn it back over to you. The, the following sections are there, are there is modifications, but it's, it's kind of spread out. So I'll leave it up to you what you want to tee up for discussion. Uh, yeah, let's just go through these. There aren't that many here uh, in these sections. The first, we'll, 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 we'll first look at the, at E, uh, which is recalculating the composite score. Uh, this is not new. We just changed our, We just are updating a, uh, a cross reference there. So uh, we have not uh, added anything to to uh, E under recalculation of composite scores. Um, we can move down to F, which is uh, reporting requirements. So we can take a look at, uh, at at one in accordance with uh, procedures established by the secretary. An institution must notify the secretary of the following actions or events. And you see uh, Romanet one and then Romanet two has been added uh, for a lawsuit this, um, under paragraph C1 Romanet 1B of this section no later than 10 days after the institution is served the com uh, with the complaint and 10 days after the suit has been pending for 120 days. Um, and these reporting, just to, uh, a little bit of background here, we've established several uh, new or revised reporting requirements to align with the changes in the triggering events, uh, including both discretionary and mandatory. And these include reporting on federal, state, or key TAM lawsuits, contributions and distributions made to and from a school, updated language related to actions against publicly traded institutions, updated language related to state and accreditor actions, which are now combined as reporting requirement in uh, Romanet 6 and the discontinuation of academic programs. So we can move on to, um, as we're working through the reporting requirements here, down to uh, Romanet four which is uh what we see added there for a contribution and distribution under paragraph c1 uh, roman at eight not later than 10 days following each transaction so again the keys back to the uh to the triggering events and um under roman at five for provisions related to a publicly traded institution under paragraph uh c uh C uh, uh, Romanet 5 of this um, 
section no later than 10 days after the date that um, uh, the SEC issues an order suspending or revoking the registration of the institution securities uh, pursuant to the uh, uh, Exchange Act noted there um, or suspends training of the institution securities on any uh, national securities exchange. Um, and then we move to B where we have some revisions there. The national securities exchange on which the institution securities are listed uh, notifies the institution of non-compliance with the rules of the relevant securities exchange, delists the securities or the institution voluntarily delists its securities. And then we uh, have added here for a state or agency action um, under the uh, applicable citations of this section 10 days after the date on which the institution is notified by the state or accrediting agency of the action. And um, we have added under nine, it's uh, ruminant nine, for the discontinuation of academic programs uh, provision in paragraph D7, no later than 10 days after the discontinuation of the programs in the institution's fiscal year, affecting at least 25% of the students. And then I think that that is about it till we get to public institution so we can stop there. Uh, we have a few minutes if we can open up discussion and we have what Brady four minutes. That's correct. Yeah, so I, I see Brad's hand. Brad, I think we have time for your comment and then maybe uh, one more response and then we will uh, head to our lunch. So Aaron, if you wouldn't mind bringing down the document, Brad, uh, please go ahead. Hey, last comment before lunch. Um, very top, uh, I guess this would be one double I um, the lawsuit notification 10 days after the institution is served. I just want to confirm again. I think I know the answer, but just confirm that if a student slips on ice outside their dorm room and sues within 10 days, every single time that happens, we are going to be notifying the department, regardless of what it was or the materiality or anything else. It's every single lawsuit in 10 days is on start being served going to the department. Well, I'm not, I, uh, I'll, I'll put these disclaimers. The words are yours, but I, I'll, uh, I, I, I think that as I would say this as currently written, um, uh, there doesn't appear to be, there's no, um, if you're asking for, is there a de minimis, is there a de minimis amount, uh, that uh, under which it would not have to be reported, uh, right now? No, but we'll certainly take that. We'll certainly take that back and, and, uh, and look at it. Yeah, it's not only de minimis, it's also within a settlement agreement with employee. I mean, does the department want to know that every single time? I guess, you know, it's also the, the I guess, the merit of the case as well, if there are any. So you would be suggesting not only what you, what you would like to see here, if it would be a, uh, a de minimis amount and, and have settlements with employees Except I'll come. Up, I'll come up with language, Greg. I, there's too much to debate here, but yeah, I, I, okay. I do think it's well. What, yeah, whatever you come up with, we'll certainly we'll certainly be willing to take a look at. Yeah, I think I saw I saw him, but it went down. And recognizing, oh, Steve, please. By George, I was muted. Um, I think this section is tied to the key cam lawsuits. Uh, so I don't know that this would be, I think this is distinct from the other litigation that Brad may have been mentioning just then, but it's, it's a point that we can all clarify. Maybe then it's single I I'm trying to clarify then instead of double I. Again, I have to go re-reference, but. In the, in any event, we'll, uh, we'll get, we'll make sure we get clarification on that. Hey Greg, so I'm not seeing any additional hands. I, I, I'm loath to rush us to. Oh, Kelly, please. I spoke way too soon. Well, I didn't raise my hand because I. It's going to take me longer than 30 seconds to explain what I'm thinking. So I was hoping I could do when we come back. From oh, I got you. Right. Okay, I got you. All right. So we'll we'll hold off on any checks on uh, Romanets. Uh, what is it? One through nine. 
Um, and I guess with that, um, we can take a break for lunch and I'll see everyone back here at one. Thank you so much for this morning's discussion. Thank you, everybody.